Good afternoon and welcome to the 169th of the COVID calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. My name is Scott Gabriel Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at Drexel University in Philadelphia. Today, we have a discussion of the Viral Art Project with Mark Kellner. Just a reminder, you can catch COVID Calls live every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time on YouTube. Just go to the COVID Calls YouTube channel to watch. You can also watch COVID Calls on Facebook Live and on Periscope. You can hear COVID Calls anytime recorded as podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, or anywhere you get podcasts. You can also keep up with COVID Calls via Twitter using the handle at US of Disaster or at COVID Calls. Please help spread the word and send suggestions for future guests and future topics. And please feel free to suggest yourself as a future guest. As of today, November 13th, 2020, there are 1,312,857 deaths from COVID-19 globally, according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. There are 10,675,820 cases of COVID-19 in the United States, up from 10,488,531 cases reported yesterday. There are now a total of 243,387 deaths from COVID-19 in the U.S. That's up from 242,310 reported yesterday, well over 1,000 deaths now day to day. As a way to bring some humanity to the numbers, I've been reading a life story or a story of advocacy for those impacted by the pandemic in some way, and I'd like to continue that now. The headline is Raphael Leonardo Black, solitary and self-trained artist dies at 71 by Holland Cotter. This appeared May 23rd in the New York Times. Raphael Leonardo Black, a self-trained artist who spent more than 40 years creating elaborate pictorial mythologies steeped in art history and popular culture, and who, and who had his first New York gallery show at 64, died on May 15th in Brooklyn. He was 71. The cause was complications of COVID-19, said Francis M. Nauman, the art dealer who represents him. Mr. Black's debut in 2013 at Francis Nauman Art in Manhattan consisted of collage-like pencil drawings of historically diverse figures and scenes brought together under umbrella themes. The work was so minutely detailed that the gallery provided magnifying glasses to view it. The exhibition was accompanied by a multi-page guide with numbered charts of the compositions and annotations by the artist identifying the figures depicted. A 1982 drawing called Onerology, Mr. Black explained, presents the towering beauty as well as the horrors of the 20th century. The tutelary spirit was Picasso, represented by a centrally placed mini version of one of his 1930s weeping woman paintings, around which circulated figures of Coco Chanel, Andre Breton, and the 19th century queen Rana Valona of Madagascar, known for her love of French fashion, who was mentioned by Marcel Proust. If these images occupy positions on the beauty side of Mr. Black's 20th century equation, the horror component had at least equal weight. It included images of three Latin American dictators, a shell oil refinery, and a portrait excerpted from a photograph of a Roman Catholic cardinal in deep conversation with Joseph Goebbels. Mr. Black himself refrained from any obvious passing of judgment. The players in Onerology including Orpheus, Andy Warhol, and three giraffes commingle as if at a party. They're all overseen by a guiding star in the form of a glowing image of the disco diva, Grace Jones's smiling lips. Raphael Leonardo Black was born on January 6, 1949 on Aruba, a Caribbean island that remains Dutch territory. He started drawing as a child, encouraged by his parents. When asked in an interview published for his 2013 show whether he had been named for Italian Renaissance artists, he said that Raphael was in honor of an uncle, Raphael Hodge, and that Leonardo came from Raphael Leonidas Trujillo Molina, the first person of color to become president of the Dominican Republic, adding, my mother admired him. People who knew Mr. Black called him Ray. A prodigious early reader, he was proficient in Dutch, French, and Spanish, as well as in English. He came to New York City in 1965 to attend high school. 
He spent a lot of time in museums and almost immediately began exploring the city's rock counterculture, going to small nightclubs where he heard Jimi Hendrix. After hanging out, sketchbook in hand, at the offices of the music magazine Crawdaddy in 1967, he was invited to illustrate its reviews of two major albums, the Beatles' Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band and the Jimi Hendrix Experiences Are You Experienced? Densely composed but done with fine-grained precision in black and white, the results set a model for his later work. That same year, he began studying at Columbia University, where he majored in art history. At Columbia, a wider world of the arts opened up to me, he said in the gallery interview. The historical styles that particularly interested him were symbolism and surrealism. But he left Columbia in his senior year before graduating. My grades were not good, so they asked me to take some time and come back later, he said. I left, but I never came back. Supporting himself with various jobs, he was a typist in a law firm, a salesman at Gimbel's, and then at Macy's, and a hospital receptionist. He continued to read voraciously. Books on comparative mythology by Joseph Campbell especially interested him, as did the work of the African-American poet, novelist, and essayist Ishmael Reed. Always his love revolved around his art. He lived alone in a small apartment that doubled as his studio in the Clinton Hill neighborhood of Brooklyn. There he devoted himself to his complex labor-intensive drawings, which were often years in the making. Jim Dwyer of the New York Times visited Mr. Black at the time of his Nauman show. For more than three decades, Mr. Black, 64, has made a portal to the world in dense miniature renderings of ancient myth and modern figures, Mr. Dwyer wrote. Until recently, few people ever saw his work because he had almost no visitors. Day after day, year after year, he continued. He labored like a monk. Speaking of his art to Mr. Dwyer, Mr. Black said he had just never made the effort to sell it. Although he added, I've always done it since, well, I guess since I've known myself. He's survived by a nephew, Gene Murphy. Mr. Black's first New York solo show titled Insider Art, a reference to his profound knowledge of art history, proved to be his last. Most of the pictures sold, earning him more money than he had ever had. He contemplated traveling back to Aruba, but never did. He preferred his daily studio routine, a painstaking mode of production that meant he left little new work behind. What I do is read and make my pictures, he told Mr. Dwyer. People who become what are called artists don't stop. There's a saying. Everybody writes poems at 15. Real poets write them at 50. I'm happy to turn to my conversation for today, and I'd like to introduce my guest, Mark Kellner. Mark is a visual artist and filmmaker based in Washington, D.C. and Brooklyn. He's a graduate of George Mason University, where he studied with the esteemed novelist Vasily Aksionov. His work has appeared in Artenal, The Atlantic, The Washington Post, and The Times, among other media outlets. His practice centers on the distortion of ubiquitous mass culture, cigarette labels, oil and gas station logos, fast food signs, retail culture, among other touchstones. In 2019, his solo exhibition, Solaris, Shelter for the Next Cold War, garnered wide acclaim and over 13,000 visitors. Of late, he's shown at Ronald Feldman Gallery in New York and the Library du Globe in Paris. Prior to the art world, he worked with filmmaker Steven Spielberg, coordinating the production of video testimonies of Holocaust survivors in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union for the USC Shoah Foundation Institute. Mark Kellner, thank you so much for making time to join me on COVID Calls today. Thank you for having me. Uh, very honored to uh, be talking with you. Today. I've really been looking forward to this, this conversation. Let's start the way I usually do, just to find out where you're calling from and how the pandemic is looking there today. Sure. I, uh, I'm in Washington, D.C. Um, my wife is a physician here and uh, very much on the front lines of uh, the pandemic. Um, as an OBGYN, uh, I believe next month she's going to begin delivering the first of what are called the COVID babies. When there was a shutdown in March, people had nowhere to go except for stay home. So. I believe at the end of November, beginning of December, those babies are coming. So wow. uh, I think usually when she works, let's say a night shift, there's uh, maybe two deliveries and uh, they're estimating up to five per shift uh, because of uh, what's happening. Uh, concerning the actual numbers, uh, I'm very fortunate that in DC, there isn't the spike that we're seeing uh, along, we're, there isn't a spike that we're seeing 
uh, across the board nationally. There's an increase of cases. ERs are getting fuller. But uh, for some reason or another, uh, D.C., which is not really a place of conventional wisdom, people are wearing masks. And uh, I notice it uh, on my way from, from my home to my studio and just walking around. Uh, I don't see anyone without them. And uh, I think that's one of the reasons why we have a little more of a benefit of, of safety here right now than, let's say, the Northeast did in the spring. We'll hope so that stays. As an artist, then, um, you work in a studio setting sometimes with other artists, or you work in a solitary way? I work, I work in a X motel, which has, a, I think, 12 rooms, and so each room but one, one for artists. So I don't see all that many people. I kind of make it my day-to-day -to, -day to be there. Um, I have a studio mate that comes uh, in about uh, twice a week. Uh, everyone's working masked. Everyone's kind of being responsible about it, which is nice. So I was wondering if you um, wouldn't mind just telling us a little bit about your own background. We're going to talk about the viral art project in great detail, but I'd like you to set the stage a little bit, understanding kind of um, your own practice, the themes that are interesting to you, the techniques that you use, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the project you're working on now. Oh, thank, thank you. Um, my practice is rooted uh, from writing, and I like to think of myself as a text-based artist, and uh, that just means I'm using letters in a way that might be different from the way a writer would uh, approach a magazine article or a newspaper article visually, that means uh, small black letters on a white background is the language that we, is how we are used to reading language. Uh, I'm trying to make signs, I'm trying to uh, use language that, use letters that are, you know, maybe about two feet in, in, in length, and uh, there's a very specific reason why I'm interested. In, in, in lettering and in using language in, in such a way. Uh, I gave great thought and deliberation as to what my practice is going to be about and how's it going, what, how's it going to be different than anyone else's. And what started as a personal identity project brought forth this kind of interest in, in text in, in a much broader way. Um, I was born in the United States, but I was conceived in the Soviet Union. My parents came to America about six weeks before I was born. And that informed a bunch of fragmentation that I never really thought about until I was an adult and recognizing that, okay, in my house, my parents were Russian speaking, outside of it, you know, I was trying to be as American, quote unquote, whatever that meant, uh, and, and trying to fit in. And the disparity is kind of severe. So I really kind of was interested in reconciling this idea of intersection. On the one hand, there is ideology that comes out of Russia. There are slogans that come out of Russia. Uh, uh, in America, we have this advertisement. And I wanted to kind of, I understood that my life was, kind of, growing up on television, I kind of understood that my life is somewhere in the middle of all of that. Uh, very fragmented, very much rooted in, um, you know, trying to remake Russian slogans, but let's say phonetically pronounced as English. And that duality really kind of became a springboard for my entire practice. So I looked for these I looked for these moments of cultural dualities. Uh, mm -hmm. For instance, the uh, the red star of Russia is synonymous with a, a, a cipher of military might, psychological fear. The worst thing that can happen to you is a knock on the door in the middle of the night, and you're never heard from again. Mm -hmm. In the United States, uh, walking around New York in the early 2000s, I recognized. That's the logo of Macy's. And mm -hmm. this intersection of communism and capitalism, mm -hmm. ideology and advertising kind of meshed, it kind of hit and it landed for me. And that began my first body of work, which is called Moscow Made American Born. Mm -hmm. And it kind of came full circle. And I, kind of, I, I made, uh, and I, I had a very specific interest in Russian art, Russian literature, and you know, fast food here in America. And mm -hmm. you know, I kind of, if I was to kind of sum it up in one line, I, I grew up on Rachmaninoff and Kentucky Fried Chicken at the same time. That's amazing. And 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 you had the opportunity to do some work with the Shoah Foundation and, and yeah. some of those video projects. Tell, tell us a little bit about what that was like. I 
I graduated uh, George Mason University and I immediately head out to Los Angeles. I, I was hell-bent on, on becoming a filmmaker and I very much wanting to tell stories. And uh, Schindler's List, uh, when it came out, was a huge inspiration for me. Um, I really was blown away by the idea of a very personal kind of storytelling within a studio system. It's a story that, that can be, that, can, that, that, that to, to an artist like Steven Spielberg is, is deeply personal, but can be told and I think really define, uh, define what the Holocaust is to a generation. And uh, it was deeply moving. I didn't know anyone in Los Angeles when I, when I went there, but uh, through temping, through leaving resumes wherever I possibly could, uh, my resume got to the Shoah Foundation. I think they were interested in someone who could speak Russian. I think they were interested in someone who was willing to work for $12 an hour. Um, I was their guy, and uh, it was a hard opportunity to pass up. So it was very much a race against time. Uh, my interest in film, my interest in history uh, was full throttle, and uh, it was probably some of the most important work I ever got to do in my life. Those interviews were done in Los Angeles, in, uh, in Israel, in other parts of the United States? Yeah, uh, when I was there, they got to 50,000 interviews and I think over 100 countries. And I think, you know, they weren't necessarily geared towards the Russians. The department that I was in wasn't necessarily geared towards a Russian emigre community in Los Angeles. Rather, the Soviet Union opened up, the former Soviet Union opened mm -hmm. up in a way that it hadn't before in the 20th century. Uh, you know, the, before Schindler's List, any kind of talk of the Holocaust, where you really had collaborators living next door to survivors, uh, literally, in Ukraine, in Belarus, still to this day, no one ever talked about what happened. And the movie was a catalyst for some kind of dialogue. And we got a chance to go to Ukraine, to Armenia, really off the beaten paths, uh, to, to have first dialogue concerning this uh, this moment of history. And uh, my job was to kind of coordinate getting an interviewer together with a uh, survivor, getting a, a videographer there, making sure there's electricity in the house that is going to be, there, where there's going to be an interview in. So it was a really interesting challenge because that work has never been done before. For, not just for me, I mean, no, it, it just is, new, it was new at the time, and it was a race against time because survivors are dying every day. I had a chance yesterday to talk with Alex Goldstein, who's the creator of the Faces of COVID project. And we were talking about the um, this disconnect that we're often feeling right now about the, the numbers, the staggering numbers of COVID and the stories of COVID. And even what you were just describing you know, really throws a lot of what he was saying yesterday into re into relief, the power of story um, at the root of the way memory of disaster is, is formed. It strikes me even in just describing your background, you come into this pandemic year with a quite unique and powerful set of tools to make sense of it. it, it you're, you've got a global purview, you've worked with disaster survivors before. It, it's It's not a kind of a background anybody could prescribe, but you come into this year with, with unique talent. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, I'm sorry that, that you know, we, for the first time in my life, artists are called to communicate messaging concerning how to live in a pandemic, how to live and how to live through a pandemic. Um, gov during World War One and World War Two, in, in the government paid for artists to make posters to make that that some of the, some of which became incredibly ubiquitous in telling the American story, such as, you know, we can do it in Rosie the Riveter. Uh, in this administration, that call didn't go out and no one knew what the hell was going on. And we were just freaked out watching television nonstop, 24 seven, looking at what's going on in New York, in uh, New Jersey, and fearing the worst. And uh, I think fellow artists and designers like, when they see a mess, they like to clean it up. And uh, I'm very lucky to have collaborators on this project. Uh, we have a historian and a curator. We have a, a really top-notch graphic designer who is very computer savvy. And he's like, look, um, we have to do something. 
there's a platform you can reach out to uh, artists and designers just to get messaging about you know what is what is this thing how do we how do we make sense of it what can we do to be safe well let's talk a little bit about the project in detail the project is the viral art project and i'll bring the link link up on the screen and, and we're actually going to look in a little bit at some of the um posters you were kind enough to allow me to choose a few that you might talk about but yes yeah, so let us understand a little bit about how the concept for the project came about and how it works uh, sure um it's, it's, it's fairly straightforward, and it really didn't take a lot of effort to get up. I mean, we live in this incredible moment where if you think it and, you know, with a little skill, you can get your voice out there, okay? And uh, with uh, a certain Twitter following of, of Ben Oshkrauer, let's say, who, who's a, a very, very talented graphic designer, he could put out a call and immediately 50 to 100 artists say, oh my God, I want to be associated uh, with something that you're doing. Uh, ben is specializing in political branding and uh, actually is having a, a very interesting couple of years because he was very widely, is widely respected for coming up with the branding of, say, Bernie Sanders. He made the Bernie Sanders logo, mm -hmm. which is now everywhere. And, you know, especially in the Northeast, I know a lot of Subaru owners that have that sticker on their bumpers, have that sticker on their bumpers and their cars. This year he did Kamala Harris's website. And so there's just a great visibility that's already built into our project. Uh, ben put out the call, Zachary coming from his historical background of, okay, I know how to, I, would, I wanna build this mosaic of sorts of all of these images that were coming in. What, how are we going to exhibit this? How are we going to uh, get started? And I'm someone, whereas my schedule is my own, I, I, I maintain, you know, I'm a full-time artist in my studio, I can shift very quickly uh, just being in my practice and saying, okay, I'm going to get the ball rolling and put up three posters this week. And uh, that really became a snowball effect. And we were able to channel that to some local press that encouraged more people to, uh, to submit. And uh, we now have about 450 various posters of various degrees of messaging. Um, again, messaging uh, based on the exhibit that I did, which was a retrospective of sorts, Solaris, Shelter of the Next Cold War, it was all about how uh, in the next Cold War, you're not going to be able to, you know, the generation of my parents and grandparents uh, would be going into bomb shelters or getting under their desks to survive a, a, a nuclear war. Uh, the ridiculousness in the Instagram age is, oh, I'm going to take uh, a poster from a show, I'm going to take my cell phone, I'm going to take this little tchotchke that I found at a yard sale and go into shelter. Uh, I was a year early for that. But the idea of wanting messaging to disappear is impossible. Messaging is going to be everywhere and all around us. And knowing that, uh, I, I think the, the, the posters that we got gave us a tremendous volume of, of intellectual ideas, of, of emotional support, that we didn't know that people needed. People have been very uh, responsive to what's been up. I'm, s I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Scott. I lost your voice. I, I no, I, I didn't unmute myself. It must be Friday. Uh, just a little bit about the dynamics of it, because you have a wide range of artists, very well-known artists. You mentioned Ben Ostrauer and yourself, and 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 then also I noticed there's sub submissions on there from seven and eight-year-olds. Uh, as well, so there's no there's no parameters. I mean, this is a sort of an open source project. People can contribute as they wish. It's completely open source, and this is really you, you hit on something that I take really with a sense of pride. It's very democratic. We have a lot of celebrity designers, um, people that I can't believe I'm, I get to work with as collaborators. At the same time, we have students. Uh, we have students in high school who were assigned to make a poster for the viral art project. Uh, you know, with college classes being canceled for fall semester, uh, a lot of, there's a, there's a very famous uh, artist in Los Angeles, Eric Junker, who also teaches a class at USC. And he's like, Mark, for my, for my students, I am encouraging a complete project within viral art. I want them to know how to engage in art and activism. And we became very much part of the agenda of the class. We became part of the, uh, 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 our, little, our little project became the core of their class, which is amazing. And, you know, as you mentioned earlier, the under 
previous times and disasters and, and war, the government will commission, and this is around the world, not just the United States, but the government will commission artists um, to create what sometimes I think are a little bit flippantly kind of called propaganda mm -hmm. posters. And maybe because they, we like to think in the earlier period, maybe before postmodernism, that those posters could mean one thing. Of course, as we look at them now, they meant many different things to the people even in the time who were consuming them, but the iconography is really is really powerful. Just with that in, in front of us, have, have any of these designs been picked up by public health uh, agencies? By Have they been sort of deployed into the popular culture or even into governmental culture? There, not, there, there's been interest in in getting a mural on, uh, based on one of our uh, 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 one of our images. Um, that that's very interesting. We 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 have over the summer we've made a conscious decision. You know, we, we really started right at the beginning March April uh, during right at the beginning of the pandemic, and during the summer, Black Lives Matter had a very important moment. Of, uh, of a call to, of, to social justice. And we didn't want to get in any kind of space that, that kind of got between the messaging of Black Lives Matter to the rest of the world. And COVID in a lot of ways uh, was still happening, was still broadcast, but there was two things going on on the streets of Washington, DC, where, where I am at right now. And we made a conscious effort not to make our project moot, but to really just kind of be quiet, let's see what happens. COVID sadly isn't going anywhere. And so we, we didn't really accept any new submissions for a while. But when we were a little more active, uh, there was an interest of, of a foundation, I think it was called Dear Frontline, that was interested in taking one of our images and creating a mural somewhere in America near a hospital mm -hmm. so the actual essential workers can see the very important depiction of an essential worker in art. That was a very important uh, strategy that was developed. And that's happening around hospitals in urban environments. I, I've seen those images, people send me those pictures. But I can't tell you for certain if that has happened with our project just yet. I know that might be in the works. Mm, it's interesting. And, and I'm glad you mentioned Black Lives Matter. I mean, what a year for artistic production. What a year for democratization of artistic production. The exactly. streets of America and the sidewalks of America and the... Um, walls, you know, these instant murals of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor and, and others um, happening against the production of the kind of artwork that the Viral Art Project is, is showcasing. Yeah, yeah. And, and we're completely supportive in any which way we can. Uh, there's a very important, <clears throat> there's an important com conceptual artist that is uh, a, a, someone I admire very much named Ai Weiwei in China. And he was oppressed in China and isn't really showing in China, it shows everywhere else and uh, was under house arrest for many years. And he has a great line that resonated with me, especially this year when I'm you know, going to my studio and seeing what's going on in street imagery and, in, and also in fine art. Um, he said that my activism and my artistry is the same. There is no one gear versus the other. It, it's all one. And what I'm looking at aesthetically and what formal properties of art making of 2020 are very much rooted in this mural idea uh, that we that that is going on in, in the New Deal, for instance. Uh, you know, mar markedly uh, by you know artists such as Diego Rivera. A lot of that has come back, and we're in very charged political times. And it's very interesting to me that a lot of the artists that are making work, some are trained, you know, art school fellows. Some are just street artists that are picking up, you know, spray cans. They're working in a very specific narrative, but rooted in a historical principle of I am including myself in the mural. I want to represent me, my family, my tribe, my friends. And we see that in the viral art project. We see that in Black Lives Matter. It's excellent. Just want to remind people you're listening to COVID Calls and I'm talking with Mark Kellner today about the viral art project. I think it's a great, um, oh, just to remind folks, you can get questions in if you want to put them into the YouTube live chat. You can also uh, just put them up on Twitter. Just be sure to tag me at US of Disaster and spread the word about this um, conversation that we're having today. I'm going to bring up on screen here a few of the uh, posters. There's so many. I hope people will check out the website, the viralartproject.com, and you can find them there. 
Um, but let me bring up a few, and maybe Mark, you can um, you can describe us some of them. And um, just going to see if I can make this happen. Here we go. Oh, yes. Well, that's one of mine. So I, uh, I I'm happy to start with that. Um, I wanted very much to connect. Um, well, actually, let, let me start uh, twofold. Uh, GetUsPPE.org is a very important organization that is organized by frontline ER physicians in Massachusetts, in Oregon, and in Rhode Island. And there are six founders. And these were the first people in America who loudly online in any kind of media said, there is a shortage of personal protective equipment. We need help. We cannot believe that in the United States, there's not enough masks, gloves, face shields in hospitals. So please get us some. And um, my wife was very much involved in trying to get that broadcast and be a springboard for that message. So get us PPE has a personal connection to, to my family because it, it's, it's we volunteer a lot of our time to that cause. Mm -hmm. and. The you know kind of the the trajectory. I'm, I'm, I am very interested in narrative. I'm using imagery that I found in World War One posters. So what you're looking at is uh, a very kind of famous shot of a Red Cross nurse serving mm -hmm. World War One, mm -hmm. and by lending by by editing out everything else on that poster, any any other figuration, any kind of text, you're left with this kind of angelic image that is reminiscent of what we imagine the Red Cross to be or the way it wanted itself to be advertised during wartime. Um, and I found a way of putting a hashtag right in her arms. And so there, there's a collision of messaging going on that I'm particularly proud of because I think it works so well because her fingers make it look like she's grasping this artifice of, mm -hmm. uh, of a hashtag mm -hmm. uh, using the stencils of like a construction set. But uh, I, I, I like to think that's one of the stronger posters that I've made for the, for the project. If, if only it informs uh, what is needed at the same time, kind of suggesting, hey, we've been here before, we're gonna make it, we're gonna be okay. Yeah, that part of it, I mean, Mark, I think we could build a whole class around this because you know, I was thinking about this a lot. I mean, the World War I iconography is important and of course, also what's tucked into the World War One story and was too often overlooked until this year was the 1918 pandemic. And so people providing care um, in 1918 and 1919, it, it could be very much the case that the same people providing care in one context that is returning soldiers or soldiers at the front were also battling the influenza that year. So yeah. I'm sure that was on your mind as you made this, but it's so powerful in that regard. I, uh, I, I, I really, I haven't seen that piece in a long time, but uh, it, 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 it still resonates. I like the idea of we, we are supporting, you know, nurses aren't this propagandistic and angels, you know, nurses are the most real people that I know in yeah. terms of like <laughs> you know, care yeah. in a hospital and, and, and sure. intuitiveness and, you know, dealing with facts, getting you in and out, making you safe. But uh, I like to think the, 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 the direct message of it'll get better is, the, I, the stenciling is very important to me because it almost, it, it has a military kind of iconography to it as well mm -hmm. that I wanted to juxtapose one right on the other. So there's a lot of simplicity there, but I promise you, uh, the more minimal it looks, the harder it was to pull off. And I'm that, sure. That, that, there's a lot of versions to get there. I'm just going to bring up another image here. Um, maybe you can tell us. I like this one a lot. Um, so um, for our viewers uh, who might not remember or who have already cared to forget, uh, Donald Trump said maybe we should drink bleach to get rid of coronavirus. Okay. Uh, Scott, would you agree that I'm not exaggerating that? Because that's a hard thing for me to say. But that's what was said, correct? I went back and watched that press conference a couple of times after that because occasionally I I forget my I said that, that's not really that's right. an it's a it's a completely insane performance on his part and this is um, this piece is obviously capturing that. So Isabel Isabel does something really smart here uh, as a graphic designer I think 
she kind of speaks in the language of advertising, kind of taking uh, what is this ubiquitous Clorox bottle. And uh, in my practice, I'm very much keen and knowing as to what bottle is which. And I also like to edit out things. And so she's taken this Clorox, she's whitewashed it, which is a very important word in terms of how we deal with an administration that's lying to us. So she whitewashes this bottle and kind of puts on, in, in a very ubiquitous font, please don't drink the bleach, making it look like a advertisement that you would find in Vanity Fair, you know, or mm -hmm. here I happen to have one, or, or in, you know, in, on the back of this magazine. Right. Um, it's very, very interesting that these references are, 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 are concurrent, not just in, in one poster, but throughout the stream of our mosaic of 450 posters, advertising, Propaganda is a common theme, which I'm really proud of. And this is Isabel Sierra Gomez de Leon who mm -hmm. did this. Um, so this would be one that moves over into the political space. Um, and again, in, in an almost surprising way, I think it's sort of showing us, I mean, I've been thinking about, you know, this as a piece that 10 years from now will be one that the explanation you just gave, people are gonna say, come on, Mark. Yeah, it, but, it, it looks like it's not believable. You know, yeah. uh, but I'm, I, I would disagree, uh, Scott, because I think uh, I think the legacy of this president will be yeah. one of, so. of a, a, a immense hyperbole. You say everything and it means nothing. And uh, but people remember, you know, there were people there were people who drank bleach. There were people that harmed themselves because they felt safe because the president told them it was OK. This one is by Laura Beth Pelner. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> this one's interesting too, um, and I think it was uh, very uh, ahead of its time in a lot of ways, okay? Because this was done, I believe, in the summer at some point, and uh, there was a, there was, this is a, this is a, I think one of the more overt political posters that we had going. Uh, the reason for it is messaging an attempt to, I don't care who's in power, but go and exercise your sacred franchise of voting. You have to do this. This is, by voting, that is how you cure coronavirus, is the subtext of this. There's no other way for me to accept this. And uh, we had a great curatorial talk uh, with Zach Levine and with Ben Ostrauer concerning, are we going to be accepting politically rooted posters as mm -hmm. part of the cure uh, for COVID, uh, you know, within our project? And we, we would be, it would be untrue to the, the, the project if we were to say no. We wanted, we wanted there to be an exercise of, of, of free speech and a celebration of free speech. Voting by mail, I think, is important because you can't, it also suggests, look, you can't go out and vote on election. You might not be able to go and vote on election day. And this is a way of, uh, and this is a way of everyone of curing this disease by just voting by mail. It's not telling you who to vote for. Mm. It's just, it, it, it's, it's, it's very, very suggestive. And uh, it, turned to be, it, it turned out to be very ahead of its time in terms of what it's messaging. Well, for You're people, in Pennsylvania, for God's sake, you know what I'm talking about. For sure. For, for people who are listening and, and not seeing it, this one is, uh, and you can find all of these posters, by the, by the way, at the viralartproject.com. But this one is, um, it's got a mailbox motif. And then very, you know, expected sort of color scheme, red vote by is in white and mail is in, is in blue. And the flag, the, you know, for the postal uh, worker to come and uh, take away the vote is up. And it strikes me, Mark, this is one where, again, the, it could be read in an ordinary year, you might look at something like this and say, oh, this is just a get out the vote kind of mm -hmm. message. But to me, I mean, it's so layered because not only, yeah, that's true, but voting by mail in this year, as you said, I mean, um, it's a life-saving act. And then yeah. in the last month, somehow in this crazy upside down year, vote by mail became a politically lively statement which again we couldn't have predicted that early in the year and it's all it's so concise 
and so beautifully rendered in this image. Scott, notice, you know, if we're living, if 2020 will be remembered by living in a state of perpetual emergency, notice that the red of, of, of the, the flag is complemented by the red vote. Vote, you know, when, when I see, as a visual artist, when I see red, I think of a stoplight. You know, I, I, I traffic in, in kitchen cliche and I, I'm, I'm interested in, in signage. And so a stoplight means stop. A, stop a, a red light means stop. You know, red also means danger. And the, 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 her choice to make the, 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 the topography of the word vote in red strikes yeah. accordingly. We're, yeah. we're in dangerous times. It's that important. Yeah. So I'm going to move on to the, to the next one here. This one really, really stopped me in my tracks. Chris Aguirre. Yeah, I like this one a lot. Okay, I'm just going to leave that there. Um, for people of a certain age who might have been, you know, getting their first um, uh, tape deck in the 1990s and listening to MC Rob Bass and DJ Easy Rock. Wow, this one is really like a tip of the hat to us, right? Yeah, I, I, I this is one of my favorites. I'm really happy that you chose it. I don't get a chance to talk about it very often. And when people ask me, what are your favorite posters? Uh, you know, we made a collage and there are certain, when we, we're gonna make an exhibit of this and I hope we get a chance to talk about this uh, later, but we're gonna see a few hundred of these all at once on in billboard size, uh, there's a place in Washington, D.C. Uh, that's called Culture House that's agreed to host uh, an outdoor exhibit of these images. So my eye always goes to this one. And uh, Stay Away From Me Contagious, Stay Away From Me If You're Contagious is such a funny way of dealing, it, you know, this is really comic relief. And I think it's the funniest yeah. poster that we got going uh, because it, it also is representative of African-American culture, hip hop culture, it, it, it's science-based, you know, there are coronaviruses on it, you know, and we talk about it as uh, not necessarily a political poster. We don't talk about it as a propaganda poster. And it just has such a kitschy kind of cliche way of just always making me laugh. And we need that in the world right now. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's um, if you don't know the, the song, It Takes Two, uh, then you do yourself a favor and go listen to that song after listening to COVID calls today and you won't look at this poster the same way again. Really just tremendous work. And of course, if you look more closely at it, in a, um, you, you'll you see the details of it that it's it's meant to look like a like a record album. So it's got that sort of, that motif of great uh, album art going for it too. Let me bring up this next one. This one is one, this uh, Jason Irla, tell us about this one. Fauci yeah. for president. Yeah, this is this is interesting because there this is also layer upon layer. And Jason's a graphic designer who uh, I've been a little bit in touch with uh, concerning our, our graphics. He he likes mine and I like his. And so he's decided to take the face of Dr. Fauci and kind of recycle the color scheme and topography of what we assume to be as Barack Obama in 2007 as candidate Barack Obama. Uh, with sloganisms uh, such as change, hope, progress, and kind of changing Obama into Fauci. So what's recognizable now becomes a little, still familiar, but is also a little alien, but of today's moment, okay? Not, not, not 2008, okay? Uh, and so we have a situation where you have to question, okay, was Obama an original image? And what makes it interesting to me as someone who is in, is dealing in you know, Russian-American duality is, I love Shepard Ferry's poster of Obama, but I'm very aware that it's rooted in Russian avant-garde graphics concerning propaganda of right. new art for a new time and, and you know this idea of cult of personality. Fauci, Dr. Fauci fits the bill. And uh, it's, it's really interesting to see that you know the voice of reason for the first time in my life is is a scientist. You know, um, I, I kind of there is a cult of personality in my bathroom. There's a there's a prayer candle that's labeled Dr. Fauci that someone got as a gift. <laughs> yeah. um, I've made a Dr. Fauci poster as well, and I've yeah. actually sent it to him. And I'm very happy to say he's too busy to ever get back to me. So there's nothing. <laughs> there's no affrontery. I'm not upset, but. Uh, I loved having- That's the basketball one, right? The basketball one, yeah. And so, so um, 
uh, which I which which went viral on ESPN, and I kind of made it my own in in in, in, in a way. But uh, J Jason really kind of gets uh, points for for merging that the idea that science is political, and science is the most important thing going right now. Yeah. You know, in terms of trying to save lives, science and voting. So you're 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 picking you're picking just the right mix of posters to to spread the message that people who aren't necessarily essential workers, that they're exercising their voice right. in wanting to do what they can to cure. Graphic designers see something terrible happening and Jason's poster is like, I'm gonna make people laugh, but I'm also gonna be very serious. And there's a ha ha, look at my poster. But if you see 30 of these, it, it sends a message that's kind of dark as well. And I'm glad you mentioned Shepard Ferry and that tension in the work between um, the the icon and and if the icon is someone you support or a concept you support it's great you like to see it presented in an iconic way but then that sort of discomfort in democratic society with a single person being raised to iconic status and uh you know it's 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 great to see it deployed here because I think it's a tension that is that I've thought a lot about and talked with about a lot of goal a lot of guests on COVID calls that it's very strange that Americans would know it's I guess this is too bad to say but we don't generally have scientists as household names in the United States we certainly don't tend to have people in the public health realm and within a short period of time he not only became a household name he became as is depicted here a redemption figure a reconciliation figure or somebody that you wouldn't mind seeing at the top of the ticket yeah yeah um and and again it it, it for the first time in my life artists are are voicing are, are are taking a lead in voicing what our narrative is going to be for our time so we're often thinking uh you just moved images but what i'm about oh, to say is appropriate for this image as much as it is for dr fauci for the first time artists get a chance to define this particular moment that happens to be social, political, and and rooted very much in public health, which I think is exemplified in the image that you're about to talk about. So this is Ananya Biswas. This is it's just beautiful. I don't know what else to say about it. It's just you you want to look at it. You want to you get drawn in into it and into the eyes right. immediately, and and maybe you see the mask second, but. Um, the beauty and then the seriousness of it with the mask is really draws you up short, at least me. This is uh, one of the images that uh, I was referencing when we had uh, an interest in making something, taking something that's a part of this uh, mosaic and turning it into a mural that's, say, you know, five or ten stories tall. This is something that people are really connecting with because it's not graphic in nature mm -hmm. uh, of, of like a poster. It's almost painterly, right? And so people are very interested in this moment, be it on, you know, the artists and activists who are messaging Black Lives Matter, or in our little modest project, this could be a doctor, this could be a nurse, we don't know, but it's not Rosie the Riveter. It's not someone who is kind of almost a caricature for a generation, two to three to four generations removed from World War II. All right, so this is very much of the moment. We also see that this could be uh, a, a medical essential worker of color. The, this this mm -hmm. idea of representation, wanting to be seen and being seen for the first time, not for the sake of tokenism or novelty, but for the sake of, you know, you go into a hospital, it's, right. it's all hands on deck. And that's what this image kind of informs me. I remember seeing documentaries of of what COVID looked like in New York City in March and April. Um, I'm really saddened that the middle of the country is, is hitting those yeah. marks now. Yeah, this this kind of, this 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 is a, such a cool painting because it looks like she's in motion, but it's frozen, you know? And mm -hmm. uh, An Ananya really hit the mark in terms of, of, of channeling something that I think a lot of people react to. Um, we're going to look at, at one more. I really appreciate you sort of taking us behind the scenes of, of each one of these. This one is a, a, a this is, a, well, I'll let you, I'll let you describe it. But just for people who are listening, this is Ben Astrar it, and it says, are you social distancing? And it's got a classic Uncle Sam finger coming right out of the center of the frame pointing at us. Right. So um, 
Ben, ben is uh, very talented in his idea of reference because it is a little subtle and it's a little overt, but again, this, this quality of familiar and alien work for and against this in, in, in the best way. So James Montgomery Flagg made a very, very famous poster of, of Uncle Sam and really kind of invented this idea of what Uncle Sam looks like and saying, I want you and, uh, you know, for public service. I, you know, your country needs you and with the finger pointing. And in this case, Ben is using that iconography and that propaganda messaging of the finger pointing and using, you know, on the cuff you see the, the, the stars of the American flag and the mm -hmm. field and in the foreground, in the, in, 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 on, the, on the surface, you see the stripes of the American flag. Are you social distancing? Is such a simple question that affects everybody, but it all comes down to the, the center point, which is pointing people out, calling people out, saying, hey, sure. look at you, look at you, look at you. What are you doing for the country to keep everyone safe? And it's not shaming. It's just kind of making you raise an eyebrow and it's having fun. Uh, some of the best posters that we have up there sure. aren't necessarily rooted in comedy, but allow for a lot of interpretation of, yes, I'm funny, but I also am demanding to be serious. And this is your wake up call. Yeah, this one for me also, you think of the other one, the, you know, the call to arms, the call for people to come forward. Often, I think that you know, Uncle Sam's calling you to military service, which in which you think of massing of people going into line at an induction center or on a troop carrier or something like this. And this one is is telling us kind of the opposite thing. You know, how are you going to display your patriotism? I need to know that you're keeping six feet distance. And the social distancing is a major theme in a lot of these posters. Yeah, I mean, you know, we had. It wasn't the government telling us to wear masks. There is no mask mandate for America. It's small communities. It's 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 counties. It's states, and um, it's a shame. Uh, you know, uh, had I think history would remember this time if things might have been different in terms of leadership. Lives, many many thousands of lives could have been saved. So I want to just remind folks you've been listening to COVID calls and we still have a few minutes left with Mark Kellner. You can get your questions in, in YouTube live, just put them in the YouTube live chat or put them up on uh, Twitter and be sure to tag at us of disaster. Mark, I want to ask you a little bit more. Um, this is a little bit more of a conceptual question, but it's been on my mind a lot. Um, we spend a lot of time together, but separate. We spend a lot of time um, having in-depth conversations these days using media we hadn't used before, like you and I are having right now. Yeah. Um, and then looking over the posters, you know, we have this sort of storehouse of iconography and visual culture to draw upon. Um, how are our how's our visual culture changing right now? do you think? I've been thinking about this, like how is Zoom changing the way we we see, the, the way we represent? And, and I was even in looking at the posters, it, it got me thinking too that the use of space, the openness and distance as a, I guess you would call it minimalism, but it means something different now. And I don't even have the correct terminology uh, to talk about art in this way, but I, I hope you'll sort of, um, put up with the naivete of my question, but I, I feel like our visual culture is changing. It, it, everything's in flux, and that includes visual culture at the moment is in flux. I, uh, I'm very fortunate that I had a gallery show in the time of COVID. I took that, in, in, for the rest of my life, I'll remember that you know 2020 was not, by, by a long shot, memorable and a positive, but I got to have a show. And uh, I was masked at my show, and people showed up masked, and uh, I couldn't see if they were smiling, I couldn't see if they were, you know, taking, contemplating what I was doing, but everything is in flux visually. And uh, the expression of going to a gallery, you know, just speaking as someone who, who is, you know, somewhat in the art world, um, everything's going on the computer. Everything's going, what, what we think of art fairs or we think of galleries, everyone right now is racing to get behind the technology that's going to be ubiquitous to the point where we can just show you paintings on your computer and you'll know if they're good paintings or not. And that's a real shame because there is no interaction 
outside of the screen. There's no, it's impossible to immerse yourself mm. in a world the, the way a gallery uh, and an artist would want you to be a part of right now. Mm. And so we, right now it's a nation of screens, okay? What it does for aesthetics, I don't know. When I go outside, what I see is images of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, I see images of Dr. Fauci, I see mm -hmm. portraiture being done in a very large scale, again, both fine artists and, and street artists, uh, kind of just getting points across very overtly, uh, making a social connection to aesthetic presentation. Okay? That, that's incredibly important right now in this moment. Um, how it involves Zoom, I, I don't know. People are still figuring it out. Uh, I'm sure there are people making feature films on Zoom right now. There's no doubt in my mind. I just don't know those folks. I, I, I know that people are questioning how are we going to connect, how are artists going to connect, connect with their audience if they're not a part of screen culture. Um, as, it, as I can speak from experience, I got the opportunity this year to do a mural outside. And uh, right now I, I'm showing something that is 120 feet and it happens to be four blocks away from the US Capitol. Um, I never had that opportunity before, but it was from a gallery that, that said, hey, we want to support our community and we know that people can't go inside right now. Uh, we have a courtyard that, you know, people come through day or night, you know, have a drink, you know, just have lunch, whatever. Like, can you make something that people can still have this interaction with art. And that's kind of new for me, but that's the trend. Everyone is talking about going outside because going inside is too, too dangerous. And if you're inside, that means you're with screens. And I just don't know how that's gonna work itself out yet. It's the right question to ask. It's just too soon to have an answer. What a tale of contrasts. The, the intensification of the consumption of art via screen in the micro level and then the necessity of the external. Um, and, and can you tell us a little bit more about that, uh, about that large piece you've done? Uh, what I did is, uh, I, over the last year, sure, and, and it goes to my practice, and, uh, and I just remind you that, you know, I deal in messaging, what was uh, a Russian-American kind of duality uh, career uh, over, the, over the last few years, blended into wanting to do strictly American imagery. How would, I, how would I distort American imagery in the way that I was able to, to uh, circumvent what is Russian, what is American? And I came across the idea that I wanted to mess with Newport cigarettes, okay? Mm -hmm. These are mentholated cigarettes that are incredibly terrible for you. And uh, they are targeted to an African-American community mm -hmm. historically in their advertising going back about 40 to 50 years. And uh, I was at a gas station a few blocks from my house pumping gas, and it's the kind of gas, I live in a historically uh, black neighborhood, and uh, things have gentrified so much over the last 10 years, and I'm certainly a part of that gentrification, to the point where because the gas station has a canopy over it, a lot of our homeless population ends up at the gas station at night because they don't want to get rained on. Okay? It makes sense. So I saw that new ports were being sold, and I'm like, hey, that's a sign. That's, that's my idea of landscape. You know, I grew up in a suburban environment and no one's going to tell me that a McDonald's sign or a Kentucky Fried Chicken sign is any more different than a tree or a river or sky or flowers. That's just mm -hmm. how I, mm -hmm. I think and I'm a conceptual artist. And so I thought about how this connects to the neighborhood I'm in. And I made a 90 degree turn and I saw a a building that just came out of nowhere over the last few months, eight stories. As in Washington, we can't build anything that's taller than the U.S. Capitol. So mm -hmm. it's as tall as you can get in D.C., eight or ten stories. And I saw an apartment that is going to be targeted towards young professionals moving into the neighborhood. And these are these are apartments that are going to be going for $3,000 a month. You know, mm -hmm. first month, last month, security deposit. Prohibitive for the people of our community to move into. Okay, It's not designed for that. And so I thought what an artist, a job of an artist is to speak to his time and Black Lives Matter was on my mind, um, gentrification was on my mind, race and disparities in public health. Newport is using a slogan called pleasure essentially to sell you death. And as an artist, I have to ask myself the question, what if? 
And so I said, what if the advertising agency that does Newport cigarettes, what words, what synonyms of the word pleasure would they use to market to the new community that's going to be moving in, this mm. expensive uh, housing? And I came up with words like self-indulgent, splendiferous, uh, effervescent, uh, uh, impeccable, delectable. And, and I kind of used the topography of the cigarette ads that I grew up with. Mm. And I made these words in the scale of a cigarette box. And I made them as fine art paintings. And then um, uh, Zachary Levine, who is, uh, uh, you know, I mentioned, he's a historian and a curator of Culture House. He's like, how would you like to do these outside? At mm. like, you know, four by eight boards. And I couldn't say no, because it speaks to the very idea of gentrification across the street from Culture House. Uh, there's a hundred million dollar development of a new world-class museum, uh, retail, condominiums, and it's, it's a chance for me as an artist to inform, I can't do a fine art show, and mm -hmm. there's, there's nowhere to do that. So by going outside, I intersect this idea of fine art with the way a construction project looks like, painting 10 coats of paint on the cheapest plywood you could possibly imagine, and it looks okay. So. That's my mural, Pleasure's Promise. And uh, hopefully, you know, people will get a chance if they're ever in Washington to come and see it. It's open day or night. That's tremendous. And it's, it's you said it's just a few blocks away from the, from four, the, four the White House? Away, yeah, four, four blocks away from the U.S. Capitol. From the, from the Capitol. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it, it was too, too good of an opportunity to pass up. Um, and uh, I, I'll be happy we're actually having the mural photograph next week, and I'd be happy to uh, send along imagery to you uh, to pass oh, it anyone who's interested. I'm really excited about the project. I'm a guy who didn't show for many years, and to have the opportunity to do so in that way outside, if it wasn't 2020, that wouldn't be possible. But to be making art in the nation's capital this year is tremendous. Thanks. I, uh, I, it's, 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 a, I'm, I feel very privileged to be able to, to be working at the level that I get to be working at. At the same time, I am trying to address the challenge. I'm simply just trying to address the challenges in front of me. Yeah, that's well, we're almost up on time. If you don't mind, I'll just get one more question in, which is um, sort of a two-part question. Um, and it's, you mentioned that the um, posters in the virtual, in the, excuse me, in the viral art project um, will be shown. Yes. And that's great. And I think we look forward to seeing, having the opportunities and I hope it'll travel. If, if, if not, we'll find a way to see them. Um, but also just to say a little bit more, you started to talk a little bit about this. Um, and just a foreground for a second, I've talked with comedian Kurt Brownholder on this program. I've talked with people in the music business and I've asked them this question, which I'm about to ask you is, mm -hmm. are we going back to the gallery? <sighs> Not for a while. Uh, my 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 wife, who's you know a physician and, and kind of you know, she's like, look, we're we're in this we're in this for another year, year and a half at least. Um, are we going to go back to the gallery? Look, the pandemic of of, uh, of 1918, you know, ended. There, there was a point to which it stopped. Uh, we're going to go back to the gallery a little more informed, a little more careful. Um, I anticipate that happening, but I do, I'm sorry to say that I am pessimistic in that I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. Mm. There's still uh, 60 something more days in the Trump administration. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm tired of waking up in the middle of the night, checking the news to make sure America still works. I'm, I'm sorry I'm not joking with you. I, uh, I, 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 I wish I had a better answer. Uh, uh, one of one of hope, but I, this idea of a vaccine is is something that hopefully can fix a lot of our problems. Um, I would love to get back to a gallery. I, I I I can't wait because there's a lot of ideas that I've seen from shut down culture, and we haven't really talked about that in the hour that we had. What it's like to go a few blocks into downtown Washington and see fifty percent of buildings boarded up on the lobby level as if something terrible is going to happen. It's a ghost town. It's very surreal and very strange. I want to be able to express that in a gallery setting in the not too distant future. I have an idea of what to do. Um, but uh, to answer your question, I think we will be going back. 
I'm sorry to say it's going to be a while. And to see the posters from the viral art project, where where will those appear first? I, I'm, I'm happy to share it, say that that's going to be an outdoor project on the mm -hmm. same walls where my pleasures promise. Oh, great. Yeah. The Culture House, we've, uh, they're, they've been, they're early supporters of the viral art project. And they've been generous enough. They're like, look, when you're ready, uh, let us know. So I've just started exhibiting my mural at Culture House. And I think maybe by February, March, uh, we'll be able to kind of vacate the space. I hope that my mural will get a chance to travel, maybe to Philadelphia, maybe to Los Angeles. We're working on a lot of different options at the moment. Everything is, I live in a fluid state, you know, everything is up in the air. But uh, the viral art project will have its first show here. And then hopefully with the right messaging, hopefully can move around the country. Just want to remind folks that you've been listening to COVID calls and you can catch COVID calls every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time. It's been a tremendous week of discussions. I've learned so much and I really want to thank my guest today, Mark Kellner, for telling us about um, your own work and about this viral art project and also for curating some of these and, and talking through some of these posters with us. Really enjoyed the time with you today, Mark. My pleasure. Thanks, Scott. I, I'm happy to, to be with you today. Thank you. Stay healthy, everybody, and we will see you Monday at 5 o'clock.